to read that decision in court. These are the charges former Minneapolis police officer Mohammed Noor faces. He faces second degree intentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. He shot and killed unarmed yoga instructor Justine Ruschik Damon in the summer of 2017. Ruschik Damon had called 911 that night about a possible rape that was happening in the alley behind her home. WCCO's Esme Murphy is live at the courthouse as we're waiting for the jury's decision. Do we think it's coming shortly? Esme, do you know? Absolutely, Frank. We are expecting this verdict to be read at any moment. In fact, we thought it was going to be read at about 4.30. Obviously, it was not. Uh, the courtroom is on the 19th floor. I'm in the lobby of the Hennepin County Government Center. Let me just show you what's going on. Behind me, you can see a large crowd of news media. This is not just local news media. This is actually international news media. You have media outlets from the U.K. You also have media outlets here from Australia. We did see uh, Mohammed Noor, the former minister, Minneapolis police officer arrived here about an hour ago. He was with his two attorneys, Thomas Plunkett and Peter Wald. He came through the Skyway, which is where he has been coming through the entire time of this trial. He looked very composed, very somber, but that is really the way he has looked throughout this nearly month long trial. Uh, the Justine Ruschek Damon's family, though, was already upstairs uh, when the, it was announced that this verdict was in, so we did not see them come in. We are awaiting the verdict. Now, there are three counts that uh, this officer is facing, this former officer is facing. The first is second degree murder. Uh, that is with intent, but without premeditation. And the penalty for that, if he is convicted, the maximum is 40 years in prison. The second count that he is charged with is second degree manslaughter. That is 10 years in prison, the maximum. And this one is a little different here. It's, quote, causing a person's death, quote, by the person's culpable negligence, whereby the person creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes chances of causing death or great bodily harm to another. That is 10 years. So that is a lesser count than the first one. And then the third count is the one that is the one that is really not really expected here that is very rarely used. And that one is third degree murder. And in order for the jury to find that that they have to find that the officer acted with, quote, a depraved mind, and there are a lot of questions about that. So we are still awaiting the verdict here. Obviously, the media is gathered, the tension obviously rising, the Ruschek Damon family uh, upstairs in the courtroom. We have not seen them arrive, but we did see former Muhammad, uh, former Minneapolis police officer Mohammed Noor arrive about an hour, looking very composed, but also very somber. As me, we know we don't have a lot of... Um examples to use as perspective because it's just so extraordinarily rare that a police officer gets charged. But I think about St. Anthony police officer Geronimo Yanez being charged for shooting and killing Philando Castile in 2017. The jury took five days to reach a deliberation on that case. Right. Here, they've come to a decision in one day. I don't know if there are any attorneys, prosecutors, folks talking about that in that lobby right now. Well, I can tell you that everyone is surprised it was this quick. I mean, there were 70 witnesses in there, or excuse me, 60 witnesses in this case, Frank, uh, nearly a 1,000 exhibits. Uh, this was a long trial, and for them to reach a verdict in about 11 hours of deliberation, that is very quick. And when you think about it, this jury is making a decision on the future of a man's life. They're also making a decision about what happened to another person's life, the life of Justine Ruschick Damon. This is a very serious weighty decision. And I think anybody who has known a juror or has been on a jury uh, or has covered juries and have covered these kinds of trials knows that a jury takes this very, very seriously. So it is unusual, I think it's fair to say, that this verdict has come back this quickly. Again, only 11 hours. And they have to decide on each one of those counts. So they've got to decide guilty, not guilty on count one, count two, and count three. That ordinarily would take quite a bit of time. They've got a lot of evidence to go through. They have videotapes from the scene, dramatic, horrifying dra dash cam video of Justine Ruschek Damon gasping uh, her last breaths. So there's a lot to go through. And I think everyone is surprised that it this verdict was reached this quickly. Yeah, we I, certainly were as well, Esme. Absolutely. Esme, what, what yes. is the conventional wisdom when, when it's reached this quickly? I know it's sort of speculation. Or is there yeah. conventional well, it wisdom? It is speculation, and 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 I think I think you know anybody who tries to second guess a jury uh, is. is 
generally sort of has a, a fool, is considered sort of foolish to do so. However, I think, you know, with something coming in this quickly, I think defense attorneys in general think that if something is very quick, it, it's beneficial to them. But you, you really never know. Uh, you really never know. And obviously, it's up to this jury. The other thing that I thought was interesting is this jury was a little younger than many juries uh, in Hennepin County. It also was a little bit more diverse. There were not a lot of African Americans on the jury, but there was um, uh, a man who appeared to be Somali. There were others that were ethnic, uh, American Indian, uh, also uh, East Asian. So I don't know if that will play into it as well. But in general, I think defense attorneys will tell you if it's really quick, Hopefully it is good for them. Obviously the prosecution hoping that this verdict comes in for them. Obviously the tension must be incredibly high up on the 19th floor where both the jury is. There's also an overflow room. And another thing that might be slowing down the transmission of this verdict is that all of the reporters uh, were required to check in their cell phones in the 19th floor. That's, that's a pretty unusual measure here in any trial, even of one of this magnitude. Normally they just ask the reporters to turn off their phones. So of course they don't go off. But uh, reporters actually have to collect their phones in order to uh, get back and report what's actually happened. So we are expecting that the verdict will be read at any moment. It could have been read within the past mm -hmm. few minutes, though, and we simply just haven't gotten word from that 19th floor yet. Right, and, and we can get that immediately. We have reporters up there, and we'll get it on the air immediately. You know, the Absolutely. other unusual thing, as may I'm struck by as I look at the crowd behind you, is usually when you have a very high-profile case like this, an international case, Judges move them to an even larger courtroom so they can accommodate everyone. The judge here did just the opposite. Can you explain to people how small that courtroom was and, and, and the problems that that it's, caused? Yeah. Yes. Um, this courtroom was the smallest courtroom I've ever seen in Hennepin County, and I've covered many, many trials here over more than 25 years uh, working for WCCO Television. It is by far the smallest courtroom I've ever seen. One of the things that I was just uh, floored by was the fact that the Damon, the Ruschek Damon family, was actually sitting next to Mohammed Noor's family. They were sitting in the same row, and, and that's extremely unusual. Normally, you have of uh, the, the, the victim's family on one side and the man who or person who's on trial on the other side. It was very, very unusual to see them in the same row. And in fact, the Ruschek Damon family actually had to walk around and sort of walk over the Noor family in that first row, uh, something that I think had to have been very difficult throughout the, all these days. Also, the actual room itself, extremely small. There were not sort of two full sides. There was just sort of one side with about four or five rows. And then the other side actually, I think, only had three rows. There is an overflow crowd, uh, ro overflow room as well. But very unusual when you have have this kind of interest in a case to have it in that small of a room. Esme, why don't you stay with us? We're going to kind of go through a timeline of, of what happened as we prepare for this verdict. And folks, as soon as we get the verdict, and Esme hears it live at the courtroom, we'll immediately go to that. But uh, if, if you want to chime in on some of these things, but just to get people up to speed, because there were so many developments, so many policy changes, so many things that happened just because of this night, uh, July 15, 2017. That's when Justine Ruzchek Damon was killed. We all know at this point she thought she heard a possible rape or a sexual assault in the alley behind her southwest Minneapolis home. By the way, if you've ever driven by 50th and Xerxes, it's one block away. It's in a highly dense uh, southwest Minneapolis neighborhood. Do we have the verdict? We're hearing is that, that the verdict is in. Okay. okay, we're hearing that second degree intentional murder. He is not guilty there. Third degree murder guilty and second degree manslaughter he is guilty that is what we're hearing right now that and is the verdict that is the verdict and the third degree murder that could have a 25 year maximum sentence and the second degree manslaughter could carry 10 years well maximum. it's at least four years i believe by minnesota statute second degree manslaughter uh four years up to 10. um uh, and uh, it's just so unusual, though, at this moment that, that this is happening because it is extraordinarily rare that police officers get Are charged. charged. Yes. It's even more rare that they're convicted. Uh, we spoke to uh, someone in the prosecutor's office. They said they couldn't remind charging someone uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, we want to take a closer look at the charges that Mohammed Noor has been filled, found guilty of. Earlier, we spoke with attorney Doug Kelly. Uh, he is explaining the charges. 
there was this depraved mind and that he acted recklessly. So the, he, you can find that he acted recklessly, I can certainly understand that, but it's not, uh, it, it's hard to shoehorn his behavior into that statue because, I mean, he's saying from day one, I shot and I did it to protect my partner and myself. Um, so finding that he had a depraved mind when he did it, I, I don't think he went down that alley with intent to try to hurt somebody. Um, which what does the jury need to find for second degree manslaughter? It's is the big thing that... He killed her and he did so recklessly and uh, he was culpably negligent when he did so. Mm -hmm. And then talk about the difference between culpable negligence and what was the other form you Gross said? negligence. Gross negligence. Uh, you know, the, the law has a hard time defining it. So it's more than, in, in, you know, negligence we think about in car accident cases. Did you go through a red light or were you speeding or were you doing something like that? This is culpable negligence, which I don't think the definition is really great, but it means some higher standard than just normal negligence. And that again, uh, former federal prosecutor Doug Kelly explaining to us all the, the charges there and what they mean. Yeah, so uh, historic verdict. Let's get to uh, Esme Murphy live at the courthouse. Esme, what's the reaction like there? Well, I can tell you I'm looking over here and um, there are some people speaking right now. I'm not sure exactly who that is. It's a little bit far behind me. I can tell you that people are definitely surprised by these guilty verdicts. Uh, the guilty verdict on third degree murder, that was the one that I was saying was very rarely charged. It's only actually physically been, or actually been charged just a handful of times in the last few years here in Hennepin County. And the concern was how would the prosecution be able to prove that he acted with a depraved mind? The second degree manslaughter, most of the lawyers, most of the experts that we spoke with said if he was going to be found guilty of anything in this case, it was that second degree manslaughter case, manslaughter charge. And let me read that to you again. Uh, that is causing a person's death, quote, by the person's culpable negligence, whereby the person creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes chances of causing death or great bodily harm to another. So it's that unreasonable risk. That is what uh, people, uh, that, that is what the jury found here with that second degree manslaughter charge. That carries 10 years. But that third degree murder charge with a depraved mind, that carries a sentence of 25 years. And that is the one that I think will surprise most people here. Uh, the verdict has been read. Uh, we are expecting uh, a press conference from the county attorney's office in the next half hour. And then we are expecting at some point, hopefully to hear from the Ruschek Damon family. It is, I mean, it is really surprising in general, Esme, and the third degree, you're right, it's just so unusual, and considering that the law is really usually stacked in a police officer's side about them being uh, fearful for their lives, I think this whole thing is going to be looked at as a, as a watershed case. And it will be interesting to see, because we, we hadn't heard testimony, we hadn't heard from Officer Nora before this trial. And so they were even wondering whether or not he was going to testify, and he did. So it will be interesting to hear how he played, his testimony played into this. Right. And uh, I understand, actually, Amelia and Frank, I've just been told that uh, former Officer Noor has been taken into custody. Uh, and sentencing, I believe, is June 7th. S June 7th is the sentencing date. Um, Frank had a very good point here. Um, he said that generally and almost always police officers are acquitted in these cases. The law says if an officer believes there is even an apparent threat, they have the right to use deadly force. Uh, our Red Chapman is here right now. He has been in the courtroom and he joins us now. Um, Reg, if you can just come on in here. Uh, you were in the courtroom when the verdict was read. What was it like? Very emotional. Uh, uh, watching the face of Don Damon once the uh, verdict was read, he burst into tears. Justine Ruschek Damon's sister-in-law actually embraced him, hugged him to comfort him. I also had the uh, unpleasant job of watching Muhammad Noor's father, 
who for the last two days in court has been rocking back and forth in his seat praying. And this is the first time he sat back. He covered his face almost as in disbelief. Uh, members of the Somali community were also in the courtroom. They too were with their eyes closed. Omar Jamal, who we've talked to, who um, was a spokesperson for the Somali community, sat with his eyes closed almost in disbelief. But the Ruschek family, as well as the Don Damon's family, seem to be relieved that uh, to them justice has served. All right. How about in terms of the reaction of Officer Noor himself? Could you see, obviously, his back is to you as you sit in the courtroom, but any reaction from him and his attorneys? No reaction at all. He did not look back at his family at all. Uh, they had a quick hearing about remanding him in custody. He will remain in custody until that June 7th hearing. He did not look back at his family. His family looked so sad, looked dejected. Um, he sat there motionless, even when his attorneys asked for him to be out of court to spend time with his family before the sentencing. The judge said because of the nature of the, of the case, because of uh, they're worried about his safety. That's like they're worried about the safety of the jurors. They will have sheriff deputies walk them out of the courtroom to their cars to get them home. She remanded him in custody with no bail. Right. And I imagine, I imagine you said that the, Mr. Ruschek, uh, John Ruschek, Justine's father, was actually weeping. Obviously, there, there's no victory here for anybody in this case. A tragedy just compounded, but there is some accountability, I would think. And I think that's what the Damon family was looking for in the Ruschek family. I think especially talking to Don Damon throughout the course, that's all he, the course of this trial, that's all he wanted was justice for Justine. He said that he just wanted the officer to be held accountable for taking her life. And they, I don't want to say they're happy. I just think his tears were tears of relief that this is over and that he has justice for Justine. Right. And, and obviously, Reg, you've done such a great job for us every single day, you know, following this case with such dramatic testimony. Were you surprised that they only took 11 hours to find the, this man guilty on two of these counts? Actually, no. I think I was one of the few reporters down here saying that they would come back with a verdict today. These jurors were very serious. They took their job uh, seriously. They knew this was a big responsibility. They were taking notes. They were very attentive during the entire case. Never, never did they slack from their responsibility. So I give them kudos for doing it so quickly. But I think that they took their notes and they were serious about what they were doing. So they knew what they were doing when they got in that jury deliberation room. Right. Well, Red Chapman, obviously, he, he's the man who's been here for us uh, throughout this trial. Just, just a, an amazing job reporting. Uh, Brit, you heard Reg talk about the fact that Justine Ruschek's Damon's father was weeping. Um, Officer Noor showing no reaction as he was actually taken into custody right then and there. The sentencing on November 7th, things obviously moving very, very quickly here. But dramatic developments in this trial with former Minneapolis police officer after just... 11 hours of deliberations found guilty on second-degree manslaughter, a maximum of 10 years in prison for that. And then on third-degree murder, that is the one where he would have to have shown a depraved mind as he acted. That carries a maximum sentence of 25 years, although legal experts I've talked to said that it is almost certain that uh, officer, former Officer Noor would do a lot less time. He has no previous criminal record. That we'll have to see, though, the sentencing yeah, we'll see on uh, that June 7th as now. Uh, officer Noor are now in custody and presumably on his way to being processed uh, back into the Hennepin County Jail. He was at one point uh, arrested and did spend some time in the Hennepin County Jail before he was bailed out and this legal proceeding began. Estimate, does Reg have an IFB? Is he around or did he have to take off to go get somebody? D is Reg still there? Oh, Esme's having problems hearing us too. Esme, can you hear us okay there? No. Apparently not. Okay, well, we'll yeah. fix that up, but we're going to go through the verdict once well, again. Mohammed Noor has been found not guilty of second-degree murder. He's been found guilty of third-degree murder and guilty of second-degree manslaughter. A rally is planned for tomorrow, 5 o'clock, at the Hennepin County Government Center. Organizers for justice from Justice for Justine say that they're going to be protesting in honor of all police violence victims. Yeah, also coming up today, we're expecting to hear... Uh, we may hear from the Ruschek Damon family. We may hear from Mr. Damon. We may hear from Justine's uh, fiance as well. That's why she was uh, living here in Minneapolis. They were planning to go ahead and, and get married. We also do expect to hear from the police federation, the police union. They said they would issue some kind of statement after this. And, and Hennepin we, County Attorney Mike Freeman is also supposed to be talking to. Correct. Yes. And, the, and those are the main main players that we expect to hear from. It'll be very interesting to get uh, all of their takes. The reason I was wondering if Reg could hear us, or uh, and I want to ask Esme, I was really interested to know ha how much they had spoken to Thomas Plunkett about uh, his 
desire or Noor's desire to appeal this conviction. Uh, again, the convictions of police officers are extraordinarily rare. Uh, and, and that's what I was curious if they had a take on that. And then the other thing, I, and maybe we, one of our researchers can look this up. Uh, I know what the maximums are on these things, Whatever but I think the more important question is right now, when you have someone with no record who is a law-abiding citizen, a police officer, I think the minimums are more important. And I think that second-degree manslaughter in Minnesota is a minimum of, five? of four. Okay. And I don't know what well, the minimum we'll is, on, is on third-degree murder. I apologize. I should have looked that up before we got here. But, but I'm not sure the maximums are going to be very relevant in this case. Um, b because, this is again, this is a man who lived his life as a police officer yeah. with no criminal record. Um, so I think the minimums are something we should maybe be looking at in, in terms of that. And as I said, that she did think that sentencing was on June 7th. So right. We'll um, and, and even if there's a sentencing, the, the appeal yes. wouldn't come until uh, till yeah. after that. But uh, what we have Esme doing, we actually have five reporters at the government center. We have some of them up in the skyway looking for people that were in the courtroom. We have some hoping to talk to the Damon family. We have some that are going to do the uh, press conference with the attorney, some that will be with the police union. So we just want to give you full comprehensive coverage. And we also want to put some context into what's going on. And for a little bit on that, you, you kind of have to think of it just in terms of recent history in the last 19 years since the year 2000 there have been more than 150 cases involving an officer where a citizen and here in Minnesota in Minnesota in has Minnesota. died has been killed and out of those 150 plus only two have ever been charged that was Geronimo Yanez for shooting Philando Castile he was charged with secondary manslaughter just like uh, officer Noor was and uh, he was acquitted of everything it took five days and now you have this other uh, trial with Mohammed Noor and so if you look at the totality of 150 plus cases two being charged and now only one conviction that's why I'm trying to let folks know it's just historically rare it is extremely rare it would be so interesting to talk to the jurors and you know a lot of time you have these jurors who do not want to say anything at all so it'll be interesting if they do talk to us and talk a little bit about how they came to their decision yeah. now in the Yanis were... case you had uh, all the video you had the dash camera video you had his body camera video again folks if you're just joining us we're, we're putting some perspective on the conviction guilty of third degree murder and guilty of second degree uh, manslaughter uh, also on the Yanis case, Mohammed Noor. You had you had ten of them who agreed on it, and the two were just withholding. I was going to talk about that. Yeah, but let's get back to talking about this one. Our uh, Aaron Hassanzada uh, joins us now from uh, Hennepin County Government Center. Aaron, were you in the courtroom when they read this? You know, Frank, we were right outside. We're now in the uh, county attorney's, uh, we're waiting for the county attorney, yeah. rather. Mike Freeman is expected to come in here for a press conference at about 545, so about 20 minutes or so from now. We don't know if Justine's family will be joining him. It's possible they could be, uh, but we were not inside right when they read the verdict. We were right outside. Um, as we know, just to repeat it again, second degree murder with intent not guilty. Mohab Noor found guilty of third degree murder and second degree murder manslaughter. I actually spoke with an attorney earlier today about these charges. His expert opinion was that uh, that Noor would not be convicted of third degree murder or even of second degree murder. Um, so he would be, of course, very surprised to hear this. He thought perhaps the second degree uh, manslaughter would be found guilty, he said, or perhaps an acquittal. So talking to an expert attorney even earlier today, just hours ago, who's very familiar uh, with, you know, criminal defense law, said that he was not expecting uh, a guilty verdict on third degree murder or second degree murder. So again, we are here waiting for the county attorney. Uh, he will be here delivering a press conference at about 545. We'll bring you the latest uh, as soon as we have those updates. Frank. Okay, thanks, Aaron. You know, the interesting thing about the county attorney, I think uh, folks remember, um, it was nine full months before he made any charges against Mohammed Noor. And uh, so this happened in July. And you may remember in December at a Christmas party, someone recorded Mike Freeman without his knowledge. And Mike Freeman on tape is heard saying, I haven't been able to process this case because I don't like the way the state is handling it. And I'm not getting any information from any police officers. No one is testifying. That went public, created a big stir. Then he had to invoke a grand jury where he literally had to force people to come in and testify. And then it wasn't until March 20th that Mohammed Noor was charged with these things. Um, Freeman just said, I need more time. But he also said, I'm frustrated. They're not cooperating.
And I'm sure he'll address that and talk a little bit about that when he does finally get to the he may. podium and talk to us. Uh, one factor that people might not remember is that uh, about a year after Justine Damon was killed in July, she was killed in July of 2017 and July of 2018, uh, her father, John Ruschek, sued the city of Minneapolis for $50 million. And that has been put on hold because they were waiting to see the outcome of the criminal case. Well, we want to go to Esme Murphy. Back to her right now. Uh, she has attorney Marsh Helberg with her. Esme? Well, that's right, Amelia and Frank. Uh, I'm with Marsh Hallberg. He is a former prosecutor for many years, also a well-known criminal defense attorney right now. He also has been sitting in on this trial and saw much of the testimony. Uh, Marsh, I know that we've talked to you and used you as somewhat of an expert in this case. You did see much of the testimony. Are you surprised by this verdict, and are you surprised by how quickly it came back? Yes, to both. I'm very surprised uh, how this came through. To have uh, a murder conviction in a case that basically they've only had one day of deliberation with 60 witnesses and 1,000 exhibits is rocket speed. The jury has the right to do that, but my experience has been that before somebody convicts someone of murder, they want to make darn sure, they want to double and triple recheck the, the information and the evidence, and they apparently did not do that here, which they have the right to do, but shocking. You told me before this verdict came back that you did think that there was a chance he could be convicted on that second-degree manslaughter. Why did you think that was a possible likelihood? Uh, because he was convicted of that, the maximum sentence 10 years. Right. So on that case, the, that's, by the way, the manslaughter case has a presumptive sentence of 40, the, the lower charge he had. Um, that's just so a... That's what he would get for the sentencing guidelines. That's yeah. the max... Right. Throw out the maximum, 48 months. Right. No criminal history score. Just if he's only sentenced on that, it would be 48 months. Um, I guess the, the point of that is it's culpable negligence, which is gross negligence, almost to the level of recklessness. So the argument was a pretty simple one by the state. I don't care what are the other facts are. If you shoot somebody, you know it's a person, and you got pretty good lighting, and you shoot them, and you don't see their hands, and you don't see a gun, and you still shoot them, that's arguably a very negligent, reckless thing to do. And he did say, he did testify that he could see her blonde hair and her pink top. Um, the other charge that he was convicted of was third-degree murder, which is acting with a depraved mind. You said that is almost never even charged right. in Hennepin County or in the state of Minnesota. Uh, tell me about that, and are you surprised on that count? I'm very surprised on that conviction. I almost thought there'd be more likely a conviction on murder two than murder three in the sense that murder three is where you do an eminently dangerous act uh, that evidences, shows a depraved mind. And that's such an unclear verbiage and what that means. I think this, obviously the state did a very good job in closing argument trying to explain to a jury, look, it's, it's not as tough as you think. But uh, it's a tough one to get a conviction on. You told me before this verdict came in that you thought that uh, former officer Noor came across on the stand as very rehearsed. He actually repeated the same lines numerous times during his testimony and that that came off as if he had rehearsed those lines. Do you think that hurt him? I, well, you, we'll never know, but I, I think it would. If you're trying to critique it exactly, I thought his first half hour, hour on the stand was the best. It was very natural, conversational, telling about his life and growing up and his commitment to being a police officer. That was very good. Um, I also thought his testimony talking about the moments around the shooting, those couple of seconds, was very good. Again, nothing can be perfect, but I think they probably gave him a fallback uh, response to say, whenever you're not sure what to say, you have this little quick phrase that it was a split-second decision to save my fellow officer's life, and he repeated that over and over and over again. What happens next? The sentencing June 7th, he was taken immediately into custody. That doesn't always happen. Are you surprised by that? Perhaps if he'd only been convicted of the manslaughter charge, perhaps not, because of all the other factors that he's not a safety risk and all the other things he has that are positive. But when you're convicted of, of a murder two charge, Murder three. Excuse me, murder three, excuse me. Murder three charge, absolutely, they're going to take him into custody. Okay. What happens, what goes into the sentencing? You said that it's more likely there's a maximum of 10 years on that uh, second degree uh, manslaughter, 25 years on the third degree murder charge, but you're saying the sentencing guidelines much less for somebody who has no right. criminal history. Murder two and murder three has a presumptive sentence of 150 months in prison. What's that? I don't do my math on that, but you do 100 months, which is roughly nine years. So you do two-thirds of that. So he's looking at roughly a 100-month executed sentence that he actually goes to prison. That's the presumed sentence. The court can go up or down from that, but that's kind of the guideline, the recommended sentence. Okay. I know that Frank and Amelia have a question for you, Marsh. Uh, hang on just one sec, Frank and Amelia. That, uh, well, go ahead. Yeah, that was exactly what we wanted to ask him about the well, minimum. Well, yeah, but I, I had a couple other things, Esme. Um, with a jury convicting at rocket speed, does that play into an appeal? And does Marsh think there's any grounds that Plunkett has to, to make a good appeal of this case? 
All right. Very good question from Frank Vassalero. Uh, Frank wanted to know if the fact that they came back so quickly, can that be used in an appeal? I mean, 60 witnesses, a uh, 1,000 pieces of evidence. Um, can they use that? Can, can the defense use that in an appeal saying they didn't do a good enough job? They can try to argue that and kind of, I would say they'd more likely try to bootstrap that to other issues and other decisions that were made in the case. The jury has the right to do that. They can say, you know, we didn't buy any of that. We didn't have to look at all this other stuff. It was all noise. And so they have the right to decide as quickly as they want. So will he be released from prison or released from jail in terms of can they can bail him out, obviously? There's, no, he's, re he's committed today without bail. He cannot get out at this moment. Okay, he cannot get no. out. So then the sentencing on June 7th, he probably will not be getting out. No, they'll keep him in there. So what happens during the next few weeks is going to be that there's a probation officer report that's done. They do a very long report to the judge. It's supposed to be impartial. His background, his finances, his prior criminal history, his attitude of remorse in this case. And then the, the probation department makes a recommendation to the judge as to what the guidelines are and what the recommendation is. Now, you mentioned some, some minimum sentences in terms of the sentencing guidelines. Can the judge go below that? The judge can depart. It's a guideline. It's a recommendation. The judge can go up and the judge can go down. Okay. Marsh Hallberg, thank you so much. You've been great help throughout this case. Uh, Frank and Amelia, back to you. All right. Thank you, Esme. Esme, Appreciate thank you very much. Uh, we, of course, will continue to bring you those statements and information throughout the evening on TV, online, and on our social media pages. Yeah, all of that's going on uh, right now. We'll see you back here. National News will have more on this. On the CBS Evening News this Tuesday, a series of tornadoes in the Southern Plains during an evening of violent, violent weather. Tornado on the ground, knocking down trees. So